DeSantis should learn from one of the biggest blunders in American marketing. Wednesday evening's overthought and underprepared glitch festival on Twitter spaces was at least a fitting coda to the preceding months. If Ron DeSantis does not win his party's presidential nomination, his pre-announcement campaign will be remembered for making a sow's ear out of a silk purse. Beginning with many advantages, the Florida governor spent months diminishing himself by positioning himself as the new coke of Republican politics. This has been, to say no more, a puzzling strategy. For those unfamiliar with the most remarkable pratfall in the history of American marketing, DeSantis was six years old when it occurred in April 1985, some Coca-Cola executives who had too much time on their hands decided to fix the world's most popular soft drink. The company changed the beverage's famously secret formula. Customers, unamused, wondered why, vociferously. After just 79 days, the original was restored to its throne, rebranded as Coca-Cola Classic. New Coke lingered until euthanized in 2002. Speaking not for attribution, a Republican who might join the nomination scramble has compared DeSantis to New Coke, with Donald Trump as the original. In 1985, people who liked Coke as it was had no interest in a substitute, and people who did not like the original did not crave a tweaked imitation. DeSantis has been marketing himself as Trump with the jagged edges filed off. But Trumpkins love their hero because of his jaggedness. And people repelled by Trump are uninterested in a smoother version of him. Besides, DeSantis is sometimes only slightly smoother. DeSantis does not merely boast, as he is entitled to, that he has triumphed over Florida's Democratic Party. Rather, he gloats crudely that the party is, basically a dead, rotten carcass on the side of the road. Now, many Americans apparently want a swaggering president who talks like that. But those Americans are, it is safe to say, not nearly a majority. They probably purr with contentment about the name of DeSantis Super PAC, never back down, which burnishes his jut, jawed, spoiling for a fight persona. But, again, people who like this can vote, some of them for a third time, for the prototype. Is DeSantis content to forfeit the votes of the millions of Americans who are experiencing pugnacity fatigue? DeSantis is unfairly faulted for not seeming to relish an essential aspect of his chosen vocation. Politics involves making huge quantities of small talk with strangers. There is something admirable about a loner in a business dominated by the professionally gregarious. Unless the loner is that way because he thinks he has nothing to learn from others. In an illuminating new book, Unlikely Heroes, Franklin Roosevelt, his four lieutenants, and the world they made, Derek Liebart says about one of the four, the combative and dyspeptic interior secretary Harold Ikes, loneliness was the isolating discovery of himself being solely right while everyone else was wrong. DeSantis supporters argue, plausibly, that Trump is unelectable. But Trumpkins, whom DeSantis hopes to peel away from their idol, can say four things unelectable is what was said in 2016. It was said again in 2020, when he again won but the results were rigged. And have you recently seen and heard Joe Biden? Besides, it is better to fight shoulder to shoulder with the real deal, with the classic, rather than with a new version. The DeSantis campaign's financial resources at the onset of the nomination contest might be the most impressive cash stash since the one accumulated in 2015 by Jeb Bush who left the race on February 20, 2016. Which means that DeSantis donors probably will not be decisive, in politics, too, the product matters most. Never mind New Coke. In 1957, the Ford Motor Company put its formidable marketing might behind a new product. The Edsel expired in 1960. DeSantis is admirably results-oriented. With blunt directness, he points to his remarkable record of enacting his agenda and says, this is why I should be president. It should be said on his behalf that governorships are the best incubators of presidents because executives must demonstrate leadership and management skills in the service of convictions. Ronald Reagan, the most formidable president since Franklin D. Roosevelt, was, like FDR, a former governor of the nation's most populous state. DeSantis' modest rhetorical talent is reassuring.
he has not risen, as so many in today's politics have, on updrafts of his own hot air. If his jutted jaw is not glass, he will receive the protracted scrutiny he has earned. DeSantis should learn from one of the biggest blunders in American marketing. Wednesday evening's overthought and underprepared glitch festival on Twitter spaces was at least a fitting coda to the preceding months. If Ron DeSantis does not win his party's presidential nomination, his pre-announcement campaign will be remembered for making a sow's ear out of a silk purse. Beginning with many advantages, the Florida governor spent months diminishing himself by positioning <laughs> Ambivalent about abortion, the American middle begins to find its voice. In the year since the Supreme Court restored abortion policy to the status of a state's political choice, the issue that for some 50 years poisoned political discourse has actually become ameliorative. By overturning Roe v. Wade, the court ignited a nationwide debate about a subject that, until last June, had seemed incompatible with a temperate politics of splittable differences. The result has been a partial healing of the nation's civic culture. Democratic persuasion demands patience regarding the meandering path of public opinion, which often changes in fits and starts. The eleven months of political fermentation since the overturning of Roe have revealed the necessity of politics, which is the business of accommodating differences. Republicans ascribed their 2022 midterm election disappointments partly to voters' misgivings about Republican aspirations to severely restrict abortion. This year, political anxieties have caused Republican opponents of abortion rights to trim their sales, restricting abortions to within 15 weeks of gestation when more than 93% of abortions occur, is now discussable, even palatable. The loudest voices on both sides have been loud throughout the five decades when voters' voices did not matter because the judiciary rather than legislatures made abortion policy. But the loudest voices have never been the most numerous. An ambivalent majority is permanently troubled by the irresolvable tension between a woman's claim of personal autonomy and the inviolability of personhood. A life that is human begins at conception. This is a tenet not of abstruse theology but of elementary biology. This life, with a distinctive genetic imprint, will reach adulthood, absent a natural mishap or a deliberate intervention to end it. The vexing question is, when, if ever, should personhood be ascribed to that life, with legal protections enveloping it, regardless of the woman's preference? Robert Nisbet, 1913-1996, an eminent definer of 20th century conservatism, writing a few years after Roe, supported abortion rights, the surest sign of despotism in history is the state's supersession of the family's authority over its own. But he regretted what the 1973 decision did in radicalizing crusaders for and against abortion rights, and making a middle ground difficult to define, let alone occupy. Abortion, he said, has been bathed in the pitiless glare of the apocalyptic, with some abortion rights advocates deeming abortion desirable merely as a symbol of woman's escape at last from the tyranny of family role. And some abortion opponents 